Hi, everyone. I'm Maureen Lee Linker of Entertainment Weekly, and I am so excited to be here tonight with all of you to celebrate the release of Extraordinary, a graphic novel set in the villain's world. And I'm very excited to welcome V.E. Schwab, the author of that book and many, many others. She truly is prolific. So welcome, V. <laughs> Too many books. So many books. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, thank you so much for being here tonight. I know everyone is very excited that we get uh, a new title from you. It's always worthy of celebration. <laughs> I'm just glad it finally made it to shelves. I swear this year is, is just 20 years long. <laughs> yes, it truly is. Um, well, I'll go ahead and jump in and start by asking um, how and when you first got the idea to tell another villain's story in this format, in the, the comic and graphic novel form. Yeah, well, so this is my second time doing graphic novels based in the worlds of one of my series. The Steel Prince was the first. And I always thought it would be fun to do a, a visual format of a villain story, but I was kind of in, an, in a stuck position in that there are three novels, two of them out, one of them coming out in the future, and I didn't want to do anything to interrupt those stories. And so I knew I had to find a way if I wanted to do a graphic novel to have it fit within the world, which meant introducing somebody new probably into the story. But the weird part is that Charlotte Tills, who's our protagonist, has this ability to see death in reflective surfaces. And that's actually the very first power I ever came up with in the villain's world. Way back when I was first writing Vicious, the first novel, um, it wasn't about Victor and Eli at all. It was about this random dude who had the ability to see deaths in reflective surfaces and ends up going to merit the city to try and find answers and ends up with these two guys trying to recruit him to opposite teams and that's how I became more interested in Victor and Eli than <laughs> this guy and so he never ended up existing but I was always really taken with that power and it stemmed from you know anytime you travel by train or by bus and you're sitting inside and you can see the outside world going past and the inside world staying static um, and so I just, I knew I wanted to use this power at some point. And then I thought, why not give it to a teenage girl? Because like, you're already so morbid as a teenage girl and you're already <laughs> so stressed out about everything. And I was very death obsessed. And I just thought, well, for whom would this truly feel like more of a curse than the power? And it's for Charlotte. And so I mean, <laughs> being in a bus crash and waking up and suddenly like going to have breakfast with your family and sitting around that table and seeing all the ways your family will die in the like orange juice and in the placemat. I just, I thought, oh, what a way to make somebody's life worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before I ask the next question, I did forget at the top, um, for anyone who has questions for Victoria, you can go ahead and pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we will get to those at the end. Um, so why you said, you know, you knew it needed to take place in some of the storytelling you already had going on. Why was the five years between Vicious and Vengeful the place you felt was ripe for exploration? Well, and this is not a, this is a small spoiler for Vicious, but not for Vengeful because it takes place between the two is that at the end of Vicious, Eli is, goes to prison. And it's interesting because we meet him again five years later, wherein he's essentially doing the same thing he did before. He's hunting down people with extraordinary abilities from his prison cell. And so that kind of made a perfect intersection, which was that, you know, could I use one of his case files, basically? Mm. Could I choose my EO, my teenager EO, to be one of the people that would have come up for him in his hunting? Um, and so basically what happens is that Charlotte looks at her own reflection when she gets out of the hospital and she sees Eli murdering her. And mm. so because Charlotte is um, a very specific and very aspirational kind of person, rather than sit around waiting for Eli to come and find her, she goes and sets off to find him and either arguably change her fate or, or affect it. But she doesn't want to just sit around waiting for it. And so that five years between seem like a safe place because it could either be a prequel or it could sit between those two stories. And I also knew that I wanted Charlotte to be in book three. So this felt like a really cool way to introduce her as like an Easter egg into the narrative. Um, I also just like, yeah, I wanted to see if I could play in the liminal space between the novels. Obviously, I 
didn't want it to be completely detached. I wanted to have mm. a cameo. I wanted to have an appearance made by one of my original novel characters. And so this seemed the best way to do that. Mm. Um, had you had this story in mind before and thought about doing it as a short story or some other format, or did you get the idea to do a comic before and then the story came to you? I mean, that's a really great question. Normally I, I can't remember. I, um, <laughs> I like never understand. I just had a call with my editor today and she was like, you didn't know this thing until you did this thing. And I was like, I've always known that thing. And she's like, I love that you retroactively decide things about your narrative. Um, so I, I'm hope, I hope I'm telling the truth when I say that I knew it was a good visual story. I'd always mm. wanted to see the powers affected visually. I, I will say, you know, that when we can talk about the, the pros and cons of doing a graphic novel over a novel novel, normally nine times out of 10, it's, I'm very happy with the choice. There was only one scene in the entire graphic novel, I wish that made me wish it was written in novel form because I just oh. wanted to like live the mo and it's not a spoiler to say like because this is what the comic is about. It's the moment when Charlotte and Eli finally meet, mm. and I just I knew exactly how I would do it in a novel. And so when I got to that scene in the comic, I was like, damn it! Uh, like I think <laughs> what I'll probably end up doing is have my cake and eat it too by writing it as a flashback into book three. That's how I'm going to get my cake and eat it too. But I, I don't think I, I just knew the shape of Charlotte's story. And something that's really interesting for those who want to write in multiple forms is that certain stories fit certain mediums mm. very well. Like I knew that Steel Prince, that, that worked as a comic because it was essentially a, a, a secondary character's backstory. This had enough story that it could either be a novella or a graphic novel. And I don't write novellas. So I was like, <laughs> be a graphic novel. And I say that because, you know, when you're writing chapters in a book, they can be as long or as short as they need to be. You can cover as much ground as you want to cover. But comics, single issue comics and graphic novels are really particularly difficult in that you're bounded by a certain amount of space. Mm. You know, 22 page issues and four to five of them. And so I knew after doing Steel Prince about how much story that was. And so I was confident that Charlotte's story, this inter, this piece of it could be told in four to five issues in that amount of space. Like, and like I said, I didn't want to write as a novella cause I'm like, well, if I'm going to write it, it might as well be a novel. I didn't feel like it was enough story for a novel. And I felt it was too much story to put in book three because it mm -hmm. would take away from the book three story that I wanted to tell. Um, well, you mentioned the steel knife. Um, did your experiences with that kind of prompt you to want to do this? Yeah, I mean, it's just such a collaborative experience. Like, it's so nice. Writing novels is so solitary, even when I mm. nag my editor like four times a week to like help me <laughs> through existential crises. Like, it, it is a solitary process. And it's interesting. Um, comic, like script work, whether it's comic or TV or film, is this living document. It's so exciting because not every word that I put down on paper is a word that the reader will see. Mm. When you're writing novels, that's a huge amount of pressure. I love it, but it's also a huge amount of pressure to know, like, everything I write is everything you'll see. Whereas when it comes to comics, there's an incredible, I would say I feel spoiled by it because I get to know that I'm I'm making somebody else do what I consider to be the hard work. Like I'm writing the dialogue and that part you will see, but I'm also essentially writing a guideline for my artist. It's like mm. having professionally commissioned fan art every single day. It's this like wonderfully collaborative experience where you find your strengths and you let the artist Enid Balam in this case, um, who's amazing, find their strengths. And, and it just feels like teamwork. It feels like collaboration as someone who's never co-written. I don't really... This is the only way I have that experience. So I knew coming off of Steel Prince that I wanted that again. I knew mm. I wanted another chance. And I like being spoiled by the artwork. Like I like, you know, turning in scripts and receiving line art, receiving variant covers and getting to see the story come together. And instead of it being a movie that plays in my head and the same movie needing to play in a reader's head, like it's something else. It's, it's like a joint vision. It's a a temporary collaborative experience for everyone to have like a, a codified image. Yeah. Why was Enid the right collaborator for this? 
Ooh, well, I love the auditioning process for comic artists. For anyone who doesn't know, I usually see like six to 10 sample oh, wow. different artist samples and it really comes down to what the needs of the story are this is a very action based story like for steel prints there was a, a sense of the magic and the style and the palette and so my artist uh is was an italian artist and he was like very into like the sumptuous fashion and the aesthetic and i was like perfect <laughs> for that well but for this this is action sequences this is dynamism this is the movement on the page needed to feel a certain way and when i saw enid samples i just knew and then mm. that first issue becomes a kind of proving ground where you start to see as a writer, how much space can I comfortably give to my artist? Like, where can I loosen my grip? Where can I let the artist flourish? And every, so like over that issue, first issue, I knew like Enid and I were going to be great together. Like he was just, <laughs> he got it. It was like, we spoke the same artistic language. Um, you hinted at this a little bit already, but how did you devise Charlotte and, and why was a teenage girl the compelling choice for you here? Because besides Sydney, we really haven't seen anyone under college age in the stories. I know. I love that for her because like I say, I just think being a teen is like the hardest time to be alive. Like Sydney even is a little bit younger than that. So she was a bit more malleable and she already had like a sense of abandonment from her family. But so she was kind of easily extricated from her origin environment. I just, I mean, Charlotte's 16, it's a brutal time in life. And then to introduce this kind of complexity into it, I just knew that there's a certain amount of strength that comes with being a teenage girl. Like there's a certain resilience and there's a certain like combativeness. And I needed her to be combative. I needed her to not be like, well, I guess I'm going to wait until this mirror image comes for me. She was, she sought it out instead. And I loved that for her. I love that she was, she was a loner and that she was lost. And you got that sense that she was all those things before her accident happened. And then afterwards, she just, she became so active in her life. And it's such a difficult concept. You know, I think about Vicious was a very masculine novel. It was about two mm. young men taking power. And Vengeful was about those same men losing power and about the young women reclaiming their power. And this book is about what is power? Like, is it an illusion? Is control an illusion? Like, because that's kind of the central question for Charlotte is, can she make a difference? Mm. And like, what happens if you do? So what if she changes? It's a very final destination, right? Well, so what if she changes the exact image that's in a person's reflection, some other image is always going to be there. Like it is literally trying to fight water, right? Trying to fight mm -hmm. the tide. And I wanted that because I think that she's not jaded in that she wants change. She wants that, she has that kind of teenage, op almost defiant optimism. <laughs> and there's a lot that I just think comes hand in hand with being already underestimated by the world around you. And I wanted that for Charlotte. Like I wanted her ferocity. Mm. Uh, well, you mentioned there was the one part of the story that you knew exactly how you would do as a novel, but was there one aspect of the storytelling you were most excited to be, see brought to life via the artwork? Um, honestly, well, the superpowers definitely, but honestly, Felix, because mm. Felix is a non-binary character. Um, and obviously because of that, like the imagery is really important, but also I, I have a very strong philosophy in all of my work about like having queer presence and queer existence and not queerness as a plot point. Mm. And so that's why I felt like I was most excited for Felix is that they are a, an integral part of the narrative an integral part of the gang that she teams up with, but their gender is never an issue. It's never, it's never talked about. It made the artwork became very important in like the variant covers and on the page. But I knew that people were going to see what they needed to see in Felix. So like, I knew that my non-binary readers and my queer readers were going to get extra out of Felix than, 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 um, you know, a heterosexual reader or a cisgender reader would. And that's what I wanted is I didn't want Felix's presence on the page to be like for it to be defined by their gender. 
They're mm. just who they are. And I, and so I was most excited for the, the pieces that a lot of people probably don't notice, which is just yeah. like the simple taking up of space on paper. I love that. Um, one thing I found reading this, I, you know, when you're reading prose, you can make something as violent or as not violent as you want in your own mind. Um, and, uh, but this really shows the brutality of the EO power and, and this, the reality of dying and being reborn and how, um, violent an act that is as well. So uh, was that something that was super important to you going into the process? Well, I think it's interesting because on the one hand, yes, it's it's like on page, literally. But on the <laughs> other hand, it's highly stylized. And so I think that that's a fun balance to get to explore when you're dealing with a, an illustrated medium as compared to a live action medium. And even in live action, you'll see a degree of stylization. I'm always fascinated when I see like a show like Squid Game, which is like horrifically on-screen violent compared to like Cowboy Bebop, which I just watched. And like, even the blood is very stylized. Like mm -hmm. you never really get like, it's even, even in its most violent moments, you know, it feels a little comic, comic booky. And so I think that that's something that I find really interesting about the visual medium is yes, like you're picking what's on screen or what's on page, but you're also choosing how to articulate. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it's fun to like try and come up with where your threshold is and decide. I mean, I, I don't feel like the comics ever go into like the grotesque. I don't oh yeah. Story, no. But at the same time, like they deal with, I would say they deal with darker subject than they do with visual. So I always mm. like want the visual to have like a certain pep, a certain pop energy to it. Um, I think there's a way to do this comic that's like black and white and red, right? Like there's a way yeah. to do this comic that makes it feel very Sin City, often vicious. The novels feel very Sin City. Um, but this is at the same time, this is Charlotte's story. And, you know, she is 16 and she does live in full color. And so mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think one of the cool things about it was seeing how style, you know, more Enid's than mine and the colorist style, how those permeate my narrative. Cause like I say, if I had been the illustrator, which there's a reason I will never, uh, because <laughs> I'm not good at that. Um, I would be like tempted to do everything in black and white. Like I'm just so unfortunately stylized in like my portrayals. I would just be like black and white and then blood is red, just blood <laughs> everywhere. So I think if I, had my druthers, it would have been a lot more graphic. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is there one power that we didn't get to see on the page here that you'd want to see, whether it's Victor's or it's Sydney's? Victor, Victor I think it's yeah. Victor, obviously, because it's a really interesting power in that you know he has this ability to control pain thresholds. And I think the closest I've seen to it is actually in Steel Prince. There's a person who's a bone magician. And so when they are exerting control over somebody, you see the entire person's skeleton. Mm. And I feel like, I think Victor, it's too easy to depict his power as like electricity to have it conflate with Felix. But I honestly would see Victor in a much more like nuanced way. Obviously, we don't see his power in action in this comic. Um so yeah, and it's difficult because Eli's power is regenerative and like something which obviously would play out well in a in an action sequence medium, but it's really <laughs> hard. Like we constantly were like arguing over like how many panels do you need to show healing? Because mm. you want it to feel like that regression, like the teacup coming back together. But <laughs> at the same time, like how much space, I, we can't give that much. It's, there's so many times in the comic where I'm like, I would kill for one more page, just one more page. Like I don't need, I don't need 80 more pages, but I'll take 23 pages instead of 20. <laughs> um, well, like so much of your writing, this story circles around questions of time, fate, and death. Um, how do you feel Charlotte and the storytelling here fit into the questions you find yourself asking again and again? 
I mean, I am a very death obsessed person. And <laughs> only, I tried to do a Venn diagram of all of my like 20 books and what they have in common. And the only thing they had in common was death. And I was like, I, <laughs> I should explore that with my therapist some more. Um, I, but yeah, I do think it's about power and it's about like the fallacy of control. Like, I think so often I'm the kind of person who goes through life thinking, like, if I just try hard enough, I can keep everyone I care about safe. If I just try hard enough, if I'm just vigilant enough, if I just pay enough attention. And that's really the quandary that Charlotte's faced with is like, there's no such thing as safe. Like, what happens if you stop someone from getting hit by a car and they, you know, you change the trajectory and instead they die a day sooner? Or, you know, they die in a different way that ends up causing a cascade of other people. Like, but also it's impossible to like shake the sense that we could do it. And, you know, Charlotte, it's just always there in front of her. Like, how can she ignore it? Because it's that constant, like, what if I could? What, what if it would make a difference? And I think you can drive yourself mad that way. Um, but at the same time, it's like really hard to turn away from the mm possible of it and so it's really about that like temptation of control and the fallacy of it like it's just it's an impossible like there's just no right answer for Charlotte's <laughs> situation there's no way to turn it off but there's also no guarantee that what she's doing is making a difference uh, maybe this is a question for your therapist but why do you think these themes are the ones that intrigue you so much as a writer I think, I think it's not that I'm intrigued by death. It's that I'm afraid of death. And so mm. what I'm intrigued by is the porousness of the boundary. Like mm. I, all of my stories deal with death and, and thresholds, but in almost all of my stories, that is a threshold which can be walked back across. So whether it's the near death experiences in the villain's world, whether it's uh, Rye and Kel in Shades of Magic, whether it's uh, Cassidy Blake in the City of Ghosts series, you know, I look at all of them and it really is about like, whether it's Addie LaRue and the absolute avoidance of death, <laughs> um, it's just, I look at time and death as porous things. I think I find mm. it comforting. I like the idea that it's not a one-way street. Mm. And I think, mm. I think all of my stories in some way deal with that idea of like making it a two-way street. Yeah. This is slightly more about villains as a whole than this book, but I've always wanted to ask you, um, did uh, Mary Shelley, as the mother of science fiction, did she inspire this? Because of course there's the name Victor and the presence of electricity. There's, there's a lot of things in the storytelling that have always made me wonder if that was something that came into play for you. I mean, I should say yes. The answer is like, no. The answer is like, <laughs> It's one of those really weird parallels where afterward I'm like, I can see how everyone thinks that. Um, no, the truth is, Vicious was originally a love letter to Cowboy Bebop, the anime, and mm -hmm. anyone who's read, watched the anime, uh, you can absolutely see it. Like, there is Mitch's Jet Black, there's Ayn, there's a kid, there's a Radical Ed, there's Victor. Um, Vicious is obviously um, Victor. What's really interesting is, Vicious was the was the name for the book because in the original draft that was Victor's like moniker, his his, his super villain moniker. Um, but the reason that Victor and Eli are named that way is because I never thought anyone was going to read the book. I was just doing it for me, and so my name's Victoria Elizabeth, and so I just named them for me. Um, and I like genuinely. <laughs> It's so embarrassing because when my editor found out, she didn't find out till like after my name was on the cover and she was like, what am I going to do with you? This the most <laughs> and I was like, no one was going to read it. It was just <laughs> for me. So no, all, all evidence aside, um, I truly just like needed to give Victor a death that would lead to pain control and pain receptors and electrocuting him seemed like a good way to do it because for anyone who doesn't know the powers in the in the villains world and the extraordinaries um they stem not only from the circumstances of your near-death experience but from your psychology at the moment of death so your last thoughts pull a lot of weight and so i needed to put him in excruciating pain 
so that his last thoughts could be about turning it off. Um, mm -hmm. And so, no, all evidence to the contrary. It's not a love letter to Frankenstein. I should just start saying yes, because it's far less embarrassing. <laughs> no, this is a much better and more interesting answer. Um, well, I, you kind of already said yes uh, at the beginning, but can we expect to see Charlotte, Felix, Marshall, and Mia again? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know exactly the full quantity of that narrative because I have to finish Threads of Power before I can work on it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I definitely feel like, especially based on the last page of the comic, like you will, you have to. <laughs> yes, definitely. Don't want to leave us hanging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, if you were to become an EO, what do you think your, your final thoughts would be and thereby your oh. power? Oh, I know. Like, I haven't spent <laughs> years thinking about this. Um, I know that my final thought would be, I need more time. Like, I just need more time. And I thought about this a lot because in narratives, um, time is probably the most, like, chaos-driven power because anytime you go back and try and change anything, you end up with these heinous ripple effects. So, like, a time control ability is just a mess for everyone. But I have figured it out. I have figured out the secret, which is that I don't need to go back. I just want to be able to slow down and hit pause. So really like what I need is the ability to control time moving forward. If I could control time moving forward, that would be enough. And I think it would give me the time that I need. Imagine just hitting pause for a month. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just started rewatching Vampire Diaries for the very first time. I have never done a rewatch. And it's like eight seasons. And all I can think is, man, if I could hit pause in my life for a month, <laughs> that would be very helpful at this point. <laughs> uh, just get through the show. <laughs> I have, I have things to do. And I think who, who hasn't hit a point where they needed more time? I mean, yeah. I, it's just, I know the last year has been 20 years long, but it, at the same time, like I do need more time. So that would be my, how about you? You know, I, I'm not sure because it's funny that you mention, you know, wanting to use that for maybe more mundane or restful things. Um, because, uh, yeah, I've always said if I could travel backwards in time, I would use it just to see like all the great theatrical productions that I was not alive <laughs> to see or missed, um, because of where I was in the world or what age, but, I, I like am very connected to my family and my mom and my loved ones. So I feel like it would have something uh, to do with that and like getting m more time with them or uh, um, keeping them around forever and ever and ever or something You're like that. You're a better that. person. I was like, I want more time for me. And you're yeah. like, I want more time with my loved ones. Like, man, <laughs> thanks for making me look real bad. Um, yeah, I want uh, more time with my loved ones too, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it would, definitely be, it would definitely be something like related to, you know, keeping everybody in their current state. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I know that you, you're, you've you got Victorious and the pipeline, you're working on Threads of Power. Like, where are you at right now? You you always have so many irons in the fire. Like, it blows my mind. <laughs> uh, well, honestly, like, I feel very self-conscious because this year has actually been really slow for me. And like... But slow for you is like, no, you know, like, a is, marathon for others. So this is the first year. I think you, I think I needed a break. This is the yeah. first year since the beginning of my career that I haven't finished a novel. Um, mm. And I think, again, you have to remember, like, I went and I, like, I wrote 21 books in 11 years. So, like, I needed a little break, but I feel like a failure, obviously. <sighs> but I also did, I was trying to look back at this year, which has been 20 years, and I, I did, I finished a television show, because I was in the TV, in the writer's room, uh, and then in production for my first show, First Kill, um, which comes out next year on Netflix, and I was doing the comics and revising my next novel, Gallant, and I think I was still kind of coping from Addie. Like, I just, like, mm. really needed a, a long nap after Addie LaRue. Like, that was a decade in the making. Um, and so I think I, I think I needed some rest. So this year um, was a little bit of, like, 
a slowdown, which is terrifying to me. So I'm really hoping next year is a pickup again. But um, yeah, so I'm working on Threads of Power, which is killing me mostly because I want it to be a book shape thing. And it's like, I want to be a puddle that extends <laughs> in every possible direction. But now I'm really excited about that. Um, and I'm working on, so yeah, Threads of Power, which is three novels. And then um, Victorious, which is the last novel in the villain's sequence. And, um, and after that, I mean, I have a sci-fi that's due, uh, my very first sci-fi novel, which, I, which is like, I'm very excited about it, but I'm very daunted. And, um, yeah, obviously I'm starting to panic. Like I need more ideas, but I am really just trying to survive threads of power at this point. Um, a short story collection hasn't been announced yet, so I probably shouldn't talk about it. And, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm like working on like a film. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, um, all, as usual, all the things. <laughs> but I feel like I actually don't, that does not feel like enough for me to talk about. Like, mm. I feel like I should definitely get some more irons in the fire very quick. <laughs> that person who has six novels under contract right now, and I'm desperately afraid I'm going to run out of ideas. <laughs> oh my gosh, V. You, I, I, that creative fire is incredible. I'm and I, run out. I, I love that you um, said you needed time after Addie because like, I feel like just reading it, I needed time to grieve the loss of it. So I can understand after 10 years of writing it that you would need that. I think I'm just like really scared. I won't have another one of those, like another one of those long ideas. Yeah, you, know? you will. <laughs> but I guess I, should, uh, I guess I should survive what I'm working on now first. <laughs> Um, before we turn to audience questions, my last extra extraordinary question is, do you have outside of this universe, uh, a favorite supervillain or superhero? Ooh. Um, I mean, it's a tie between like Magneto and Loki. Mm. I think I like- Both excellent choices. Yeah, I love narcissists, obviously. <laughs> I, um, I really like people who have a sense of, I mean, it's weird. I shouldn't have said Loki then. For, for Magneto- I love a villain who has a sense of conviction mm. because I think, and I don't want to go so far as to be like, the villains are the heroes of their own story, but they are the protagonists of their own story. And so I really do, I'm always asking whenever, so I'm working on one of the villains in Threads of Power right now, and it's very important that I spend time with them and think like, well, they're that protagonist. So it, what is the story through their eyes? What, what does the story look like? I don't like lawless chaos. Um, and even Loki obviously has like a front of chaos, but I mean, there's obviously a lot of like personal woundedness there. Mm -hmm. So like, give me a person who is wounded and projecting villainy at all times. Um, I'm always looking for the logic. I really dislike villains that are anarchic. Like, mm -hmm. I love somebody playing the Joker. Like, the Joker has been one of the best acted characters for a very long time. But at the same time, it's very difficult to connect with them because, like, chaos and anarchy are difficult principles, whereas a grudge or a sense of conviction or a, an anger, a frustration. I mean, there's a reason that, like, I'm a big fan of the new Spider-Man movies and, like, the Vulture, um, Michael Ke Keaton, that's, like, such a good good yeah. I mean he's perfect but it's also because like the dude has a reason he has something mm. to be angry about I like my characters but whether they be heroes or villains to have something that they care deeply about so apathy doesn't really work for me in characters um but yeah give me give me a character a baddie with conviction <laughs> Um, okay, well, I'm going to switch over to the audience questions okay. in the Q&A here and start uh, by asking, Jessica Thompson asks, what is one book you wished you'd wrote? Ooh, it's really interesting. I read a lot. I read, I'm on track to read like 150, 160 this year. And I, I never, there are things I envy about books, but most of the time what I envy about them is that I never could have written them. Mm. Like I can't wrap my head around them like when they're so good but they're also so different from what I write that like I can't pick them apart because there's a lot of books I read that I can pick apart and dissect and see how I would have done it and relate to it but the ones I kind of marvel at are the ones that bear no resemblance to anything I would ever write and so I, they almost feel opaque to me 
Mm. Like uh, an example of that would be like Piranesi by Susanna Clark. If I had written that book, it would have looked completely different. <laughs> or like, um, you know, Erin Morgenstern's work. It just doesn't, I don't, my brain doesn't work the way hers works. And so, um, and so my favorite stories, I think of like Song of Achilles. I could never, nor do I wish I had, because it wouldn't have been <laughs> the same story at all. I think if there's one that I can connect to more that I wish I could have written, it would have been like probably the graveyard book. Hmm. Cause that again, death, death and cemeteries and identity and found family. Like it's got all the pieces of a book that I would write. It's just done so damn well. Um, so, uh, another question is how do you flesh out your plot and learn to filter and fix any plot holes that may arise? Ooh, you know, uh, plot is my great weakness. And so I spend a lot of time on it. Like pl plot is my, my inherent weakness, meaning it's not the first thing that works for me. I have to go in search of it. Um, it's not like a lot of the other pieces, which I feel more comfortable with. So that's saying I, I work a lot harder on plot and a lot of getting comfortable with a quantity of plot and understanding it is reading. Like whenever I'm reading other books, I'm looking to see how much plot they have and I'm looking to see how they manage it. And I think that's, I mean, that's what we do. We, we as creatives consume things twice, first as just the enjoyment and second as a, a dissection of why does it work? And so um, I look to that. I look to stories that I feel are working. I also, and I think I always say that cultivates the sense of what I call the story monster, which is just that like innate sense you have behind your ribs that says when something is working. I also, it goes hand in hand with my world building because this is a, there's a version of the question, this question that I get, which is like, how do you know when you've done enough world building? Uh, I come from the anime school. I like, that's not an official school, but the way that I like to think <laughs> of my world building and my plot is in tandem. And it's that if you watch an anime, if you watch the very first episode of an anime, uh, they don't tell you anything. Like you are dropped <laughs> in and everything you learn is contextual. And I say that because for me, plot and character and conflict and world building should all be entangled. Nothing should ever feel like it's floating. Like we're not making a Sims game here. We're making a story. And so like conflict is at the heart of plot. Um, the way that I kind of get a handle on it is that I write backwards. I write my endings first. I don't necessarily like type them out, but I get the ending so that I understand exactly what I'm working toward. And once I have that, I can rewind and I can figure out, okay, well, here's five things that I know I need to have happen along the road to that ending. And then I can start fleshing out the space between the five things. I can start adding, adding some bends because like I can figure out what's the straightest line from beginning to end. And once I have the straight line from beginning to end, it's about messing it up. But that helps, having that ending helps me figure out who my characters are at the end of the story to figure out who they will need to be at the beginning. It helps me figure out a lot. So when in doubt, I say, come up with an ending that excites you. Mm. Uh, I love this question. Do you find characters tell you their story or that you tell theirs? No, I'm the god. I'm the <laughs> god. No, seriously, I, I like truly, every now and then a character will like say something surprising, but they don't, if my characters start doing things that they shouldn't, then that's on me, I feel like, because I made them. No, I, and part of this comes down to the fact that like, I'm a planner. I am an outliner. I'm a strategist. A lot of my discovery takes place before I actually start writing the book. So I spend a lot of time with my characters, turning them over Rubik's Cube style, figuring out their story. But because I do that for so much time before I start writing them, when I do start writing them, they should, they should follow the line. And that's not to say that they don't gain depth, that they don't, they don't do certain things which add layers of complexity, but they should not, they should not start behaving like other people. But because I, I spend a lot of time on backstory. God, if I like, if I tallied up how much of my current, of the current threads of power draft is backstory, it, it would break my heart a little bit just because it's a lot of work. But I do that because even if those flashbacks and that backstory don't get into the book, they're informing everything that does. Hmm. So because of that, I guess you could say my characters tell me their story, but we figure out the story together. 
the character and I before the drafting process for them starts. Once the drafting process starts, I'm like, you better stay who <laughs> we think you are. <laughs> Uh, is there a specific scene from Vicious that you would like to see in graphic novel format? Oh man, of course. I mean, because there's only a portion of one of the issues that's given over to Victor and Eli's college years, because it's not their story. It's really just for backstory for Eli. I would obviously love to spend more time with Victor. I would love to just see the scene where Victor meets Sydney. I'd love to see the scene where Sydney resurrects Dole. Like there's just moments, because like I say, I, I play them like movies in my own head. And so there are so many moments where I just, I'm like, but I want to see it. Um, but yeah, probably most of them have to do with like the relationship between Victor and Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, maybe someday you can do one of those like fully illustrated versions <laughs> or something. <laughs> I know I have to do an adaptation that's like just a graphic novel adaptation of one of my books, mostly because like I do try to think of myself as a cinematic writer and I hope that people can kind of see the movie in the novel. Yeah. But at the same time, I kind of, that's why I think why I love fan art so much is like, I just feel spoiled because it allows me to see those moments. It allows me to see my characters in those moments the way other people see them. Mm. Um, who is your favorite Vampire Diaries brother, Stefan or Damon? Look, I truly, I watched the show when it first started, obviously. And I got up to about five seasons before I was like, we gotta, you guys are just cycling back and forth like a ping pong ball here at this <laughs> point. But I will say like, I'm, I'm only like seven episodes into season one. The, the brooding, the angst, I have already gotten one of my friends to start watching it for the very first time. She's never seen it before. And like, I obviously, as someone who has written a vampire show, uh, again, like I say, First Kill coming out next year, a like a gay girl vampire show, but like a vampire show, it's so, it's so delightful to me to like, I, I'm in first season. I need to get through the awkwardness of the first season. Cause obviously that's the whole, like, I know what you are of it. <laughs> but um <laughs> You know, it's a real testament to Paul Wesley, to Stefan, that like, I don't hate him because like normally <laughs> I would, I'm just a Damon style person. Like I would automatically go for the bad brother. That's just in my heart of hearts who I am. And um, it's like Stefan's eyes are so good. I'm pretty sure that this show is like one of the reasons I thought I was straight for like a solid five years <laughs> longer than I was just because I was like, well, I must be straight. <laughs> eyes are so hot <laughs> um so I will say like 10 out of 10 for the brooding um and I will say that season one I am obviously team Stefan but I now again I have not rewatched this since it aired and and I remember though that season three is amazing and I feel like once I get to season three all bets are off but I'm in it <laughs> just for Stefan's eye line at this point, because it, it is very like confusing for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could write a book that is a reimagining of something else, what would it be? It might be Vampire Diaries. I mean, like at this point, <laughs> at this point, like <laughs> I know, uh, okay, a book that is a reimagining. I mean, yeah, I would probably, I mean, here's the thing, could it be a reimagining of another book is the problem, because I, like, really, yeah. like, I, again, it's, I haven't actually written a vampire novel, because I wrote a vampire short story that became First Kill. I do really want to write a vampire novel. If I could mm. do, like, an updated, is it Carmel, Camilla? Like, what's the, the lesbian <laughs> vampire? Yes, oh, man, Camilla? Is it Camilla? Camilla? I'd like to do an updated Camilla. I mean, I nice. think I just, I can't help myself. I just, <laughs> I, I have such a thing for vampires and I always have, like, it's very hard to ruin it for me. I, I mean, I, the, the, obviously certain movies have tried, but like in novel <laughs> form, I am really just like game for it all the time. I don't know. I, but I gotta say, if anyone's on the fence and is like hit the point of 2021 where you're like, this is the year that is going to kill me. I am like highly recommending this Vampire Diaries rewatch because it has already made my winter far more enjoyable. 
<laughs> also, yeah, I don't, I'm not, people are bringing up Klaus and now like, we're not getting into the fact that like, obviously Elijah is the best part of the show, but I'm not there yet. So I'm only addressing the parts that I have reached. <laughs> uh, what surprised you the most from the graphic novel process? Ooh, okay. <sighs> Cause there's one thing I don't like about it. So this is the thing that surprised me most because anyone who notices that Vic, well, they will notice when they see the graphic novel, Victor is wearing shades of gray hmm. and Victor doesn't wear shades of gray. Victor wears black, but it would come up too flat in the comic. I like pushed and I pushed. I was like, no, Victor wears bl just black. And they're like, he can't wear black. It is going to like look wrong. It will literally disrupt how the entire comic looks because stylistically we didn't go for that kind of comic. And so it drives me crazy. The closest I was allowed to have was like charcoals. And I was <laughs> like, this is a problem and the fandom is going to kill me. But um, yeah, it's things you don't think of like the colors and the way they work together. Again, speaking as somebody who works in a very muted palette, I was like, <laughs> this is a lot of color. Uh, but it's, yeah, I would say that the, what surprised me was that, was that concessions have to be made for the form of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca Taylor asks, I'm a newbie to your books. So excited to have found them and loving the Darker Shade of Magic series. What should I read next? What is the best order for your books? Oh God. Well, after Shades of Magic, I would do Addie LaRue. Mm. And then after Addie LaRue, I mean, I'm also like, I, on that little grid, I am like lawful evil. So like keep this in <laughs> mind. Cause I'm like after Addy, I go to vicious because those could not be more different. And I think that like, sometimes it's good to just whiplash yourself between mm. stories. So your, your options from shades of magic are really, most people go from Addy to shades of magic, but since you've already done shades of magic, you really have a very difficult decision to make now because you can either go to Addy She's a very cozy, like good read for winter. Definitely need to have a latte on you. Lots of existential feelings, very quiet. Or you can go to Vicious, which is like super villains hunting each other down for sport. And I think you really have to decide what you're in the mood for this winter. It's like, are you, it's really the difference between a whiskey and a hot chocolate. And I think you kind of have to decide where you want to be at the moment. <laughs> um, and then uh, somebody asked, what are you cur currently reading? Oh my goodness. What am I currently reading? Um, well, I just finished a novel, reading a novel that doesn't come out until next year, which feels mean, mm -hmm. but you should all be aware of it. It's called The Night Ship. It is the new Jess Kidd novel. Jess Kidd wrote uh, Things in Jars and himself and is like a really fabulous, dark, speculative writer deeply unnerving and <laughs> I am just about to start I think it's called Our Crooked Hearts by Melissa Albert that is the next one on my list I also read a book called Real Easy by Marie Retkowski which is her she writes amazing YA and this is her adult thriller debut and it was fabulous um, well, I'm going to bring things home with yeah. the question of our time. Oh, no, sorry. I will save that for last because I saw there's another one down here at the bottom and we have a little more time. Uh, so uh, somebody says, Addie is my favorite book. What are your top three books uh, this year or of all time? Your choice. I was going to say, that's a brutal question. So I will do recent. So my top three recent books, they're all very weird. One is, I think it's called Build Your House Around My Body. Truly one of the best titles ever. Deeply, deeply strange. One is, I, I, I hate pressure. Um, <laughs> I'll do Circe. Okay. Obviously a very, very good book. And you know what? I was so pleasantly surprised. I don't want, that sounds condescending. I was so happy with Hail Mary, which is Andy Weir's book, the author of The Martian. It's a sci-fi and it was 
amazing. So there you've got like three very different choices. Okay. You can't go wrong, but I also, I do keep a Goodreads that anyone can find me on. And I just use it for like keeping track of what I'm reading. I'm very stingy with five stars, but like if you, five stars are the only rating I give. So you can search my Goodreads for five stars. And if I give something five stars, then it means like it kind of rocked my world. Mm. Okay. And then lastly, I'm going to bring things home with the question of our time, which is, do you prefer the Vampire Diaries originals or Legacies? Oh my God. Well, I never watched Legacies. Um, I did really like the originals. What I saw, I haven't finished any of them. I'm a monster, but I will say for me, it's not a Vampire Diaries because I think that's like the OG. It's where it all starts. It's like the introduction to everything great. And like I say, I'm watching this 11 years on, it holds up. I mean, it's camp. It is incredibly campy, but it's good camp. Like yeah. it's really, it's, it's, it's potent and it's working. It's doing what it says on the box. And I am glad for that. So Vampire Diaries. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want a little camp with their vampires? Oh, and it's I feel so like they smoldering. go hand in hand. <laughs> it's pure smoldering faces. There's so much. If I want, I'm sure there are super cuts out there of just Stefan looking into space, looking angsty. <laughs> but you know what? I would, well, I'd put that as a screensaver on my computer. And <laughs> That's amazing. All right, everybody. Well, that concludes our conversation with V. Schwab today. Thank you so much for joining. And Extraordinary is on shelves now if you would like to get yourself a copy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you.